First off, I um, wanted to talk about the settings that we're going to use um, in our cameras. And, and this, this list here is not 100% um, settings that we can change, but I think it's all good stuff to keep in mind. Um, so first off, uh, I think it's really important to keep in mind how much storage space you have on your phone. Um, when we're shooting with uh, digital cameras um, externally, we uh, or you know outside oh I lost my uh, with you know when we're using a camera that uses like an SD card or something like that we can get a 64 gig card that that'll shoot two hours of HD footage we could get a 128 gig card you can shoot for four hours um, the, the storage um, is kind of expandable to the point where it's not an issue it's not really something that we need to be concerned about um, with shooting on a cell phone. Uh, depending on the type of phone that you're using, it uh, can be a limiting factor. Um, where with like the phone that I have right now, it's a, a, a Pixel 3 XL. Um, there's no SD card slot in it. So I'm limited to the 64 gigabytes of storage space that, that it came installed with. And the more we shoot and the more apps that we install, the less space we have. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna go shoot a couple scenes for my short film and you uh, are off in the woods and you start shooting um, and you run out of space, you're gonna be out of luck. So you wanna uh, either make sure that you have plenty of open space or if you have a camera that does accept a, a SD card, you could expand the amount of space that you have on your camera or on your phone, or you know, even iPad, uh, I guess we could expand it to other mobile devices. Um, so, and, and if, you, if you have been shooting and um, you're working with some footage, try to, try to take note of how much space that footage is taking up on the phone. Uh, different phones and different, different cameras and phones are gonna shoot at different bit rates. Um, and so uh, a camera that shoots at a higher bit rate will create higher quality footage but it's also going to use up the space on that uh, camera uh, phone. I'm going to keep on flipping those uh, again and again, but we all know what I'm talking about. It's going to eat up that space more uh, quickly, and it's going to make it harder to shoot, you know, all day long. So, so either try to free up some space or try to expand the space that you have accessible to you. Um, doo -doo -doo. Going back to my shared screen here. Then when we get into the settings that we have uh, accessible to us in the phone, um, we wanna uh, look at what types of resolutions we can shoot on our phone. It's, it's crazy like how high the resolution is getting uh, that we can shoot. Um, for, for quite a while, we've been able to shoot full HD footage or 1920 by 1080 resolution. Um, but a lot of phones these days are able to shoot up to 4K resolution. And again, depending on how much space that you have to store your footage, um, that might be a limiting factor. But um, if you can shoot a higher resolution, it's probably a good idea to do so because it's gonna, you're gonna be starting off um, with higher quality so that as you transfer or upload um, to the internet, um, you know, starting off at higher quality is gonna give you um, higher quality all the way down the line. So if, you, if you've got plenty of space on your phone and you can shoot 4K, I'd recommend it. Um, the next point here, uh, we all know that, you know, um, you can shoot vertical or you can shoot horizontal or landscape on our phones. If we're shooting something and we're, we're trying to make a, a kind of a well-crafted uh, video production, um, we, we want to shoot landscape. We want to turn that phone sideways um, because it's not automatically going to do that for us if we hold the phone vertically. Um, and it might sound um, obvious, but it's, it's really easy to, you know, fall into just holding that phone the way you do the rest of the time and, and shoot vertical. But shooting landscape is going to look more professional and it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel more like, a, a, you know, a, a good real video production in the end. Um, we wanna stay steady with our phones when we're shooting. Uh, a lot of phones have uh, camera stabilization built into them. 
So they are gonna smooth out the video that you're shooting. But if you have too much uh, shakiness, that stabilization can end up making the video look kind of wobble. It can look kind of like, it's like, a, it's like, I don't know, being reflected in water or it's a kind of, of a jello-y effect. Um, so if we can try to hold it steady, uh, the camera will have to do less internal stabilization and it will give you uh, cleaner looking footage. And we can do that by holding it with two hands rather, rather than one. We can uh, try to keep our footage uh, steady by using a, a, a device to study that, uh, what we were just talking about earlier, um, with different um, options for uh, stabilizing. So my trusty site that I always go to to give examples of different types of gear, b and uh, they're not a sponsor. Um, We go on and, and, and look at uh, cell phone gimbals. Uh, you can see there's a lot of different options out here. Um, DJI is a really well-respected uh, company when it comes to building uh, gimbals. They, they, they started out primarily doing drones um, for, for shooting video, but that same technology that makes the, the footage so steady on a drone, um, they've, they've designed a lot, um, some really decent gimbals uh, for mounting a cell phone. Um, another one, we actually have, we don't have one of these uh, phone mountable uh, Zion Tech uh, gimbals. We have one that you can mount larger cameras onto, but it's another company that produces some really high quality uh, gimbals. Um, and so what a gimbal is, is it's, uh, it has three axes of rotation and uh, it balances the device electronically. Um, so it's not like you have to get the weight balanced on it, but it's not like a, a steady camera, a glide cam, where it's solely based on balancing the weight of the, cam the camera on the device. Um, this is going to electronically uh, balance it, and you can. Uh, uh oh, uh, can anybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, uh, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw that in the chat. Rebecca, are you okay now? Cool, good. Um, if anybody else has anything else come up, please let me know. Um, sorry if I didn't see that quick enough. Um, so yeah, so these these will work really well. Um, one of the, one of the things that I was concerned about when we first were thinking about getting one was battery life and and how um, you know this this device that's tiny and lightweight. Um, and electronic uh, with, with all these motors in it. I, I was worried that it would run out very quickly, um, but they, they actually, they advertised that they'll work for like a full 12 hour day of shooting on one charge. Um, and those ones that you can mount a cell phone on are small enough that you could, you could fit them in a, in a you know, a, a backpack or a purse or, or anything like that. Um, and if, if you're, you're trying to shoot really like smooth um, stabilized footage that that can be a, a good thing to use. Other options, you, you know, there's always the selfie stick or uh, a tripod with um, a, a phone holder mounted on it. Um, they make small tripods. It's gonna unscrew that thing here. Um, you can get, you know, uh, tripods like this that uh, you can mount a phone on and it, it keeps it small so that you can just throw it on a desk um, or sometimes just you know propping the phone up like you could prop it on <laughs> a desk or up against something and um, having it be stable like that is, is going to be uh, beneficial to giving you um, steadier footage okay back into these notes uh, many phones use digital zoom, um, and digital zoom is something that we want to avoid using because as we zoom in digitally, we're going to lose some of the quality of the resolution of the, uh, of the, the camera. Um, I know there are some of the newer phones um, are coming out with multiple lenses on them, so they might have a wide angle lens and a telephoto lens, and as you zoom in, it's actually swapping between those two lenses. 
that's not necessarily going to have the same issues all the time. I, I'm not sure uh, if um, at some point those cameras transition into using digital zoom. But um, at this point, I, I would recommend against using uh, zoom if, if your camera is using digital zoom. And so um, what do we what do we do then? It, it can it may push us into moving the camera around rather than zooming in and out. So if we're shooting our subject and we're getting you know a medium wide shot of them, medium shot to the from the waist to the above their head, and then you want to go in for your close up, rather than zooming in from that medium shot to your close up, you would just go closer. Just move around with the phone and uh, get your different angles and compositions that way. This can seem like a pain, but it, it, I, I feel like it's also, it can be beneficial because it can help you to, um, to get different compositions that you maybe didn't think of. And Nina, yeah, nothing wrong with the dolly shot, nothing, nothing wrong with starting wide and moving in to get close. Um, it can give you some really cool um, cinematic effect. And finally, my last point on here, um, if you're editing in phone, there's some softwares that we're going to talk about later that we can use to edit on the phone. If, if you're editing in phone, I'd, rec I'd recommend to try not to overshoot. If you can minimize the number of takes you're using, if you can minimize the amount of, you know, kind of um, stopping and resetting and, okay, we're ready to go again, but you didn't cut, so you kind of have this garbage between takes. Um, because editing on a touch screen, on a tiny little uh, touch screen, it's, it's kind of clunky. And if you have way more than you need, it makes it even worse. If you can try to keep your cuts or keep your shots trimmed down to, you know, we're calling action, we're, you know, hitting record and calling action, and then we're calling cut and we hit stop so that we don't have too much head or tail on our shots that we have to then kind of drown in when we're editing later on. Um, trying to keep it efficient and clean um, so that we can, you know, we're almost editing in camera um, rather than the old let's fix it in post adage, which, you know, all that means is let's drive our editor crazy, you know. Well, we're shoot if you're shooting all this stuff on your phone at home and you're editing it all, you're the one that's shooting, you're the one that's editing. Don't, don't drive yourself, your future self crazy. You can save yourself the trouble and try to keep it um, as, keep the amount of footage as manageable as possible. Okay, so some composition tips, and this is, you know, it's pretty basic stuff that you'll, you'll hear about in pretty much any video class or uh, photography class, um, but it's, it, it's worth um, touching upon. And, and I feel like it's, it's good to think about these things, these kind of larger scale concepts when you're shooting on a mobile device. Um, because, and, and this happens with, with pretty much any camera, we're, we're, we're shooting on such small screens, it can be difficult to visualize what that's gonna look like when it's on a larger screen. So if we are you know, shooting, the way I'm framed right now, is is kind of how on this little screen that I'm looking at, I've got my phone down here. So this is what I look like. You can see that, but I can't. Um, we end up framing kind of closer than we would want to if we were looking at it on the large, you know, 60 inch screen or up on uh, projected on a, a screen at a movie theater. Um, things end up being shot really close up on smaller screens, I find, because it's it's difficult to see what we're shooting. Um, and so if we kind of think about some of these composition um, pointers, it can be helpful to understand that we're not just gonna be watching this on a cell phone. Maybe that's how it's gonna be viewed most of the time, but hopefully we're sharing things with people that are watching it on larger screens. And that's when shooting um, wider scale shots where there's more interesting compositions happening um, can be really helpful. So first off, uh, using the rule of thirds, man, I keep on clicking on this thing and it jumps to the next page. Using the rule of thirds uh, uh, can really help to create pleasing compositions. Um, this picture right here is an example of the rule of thirds where 
um, we've drawn a vertical line a third of the way in from either side of the screen and a horizontal line in a third of the way in from each uh, the top and bottom of the screen. And on those intersection intersecting points, that's where we're trying to frame our subjects. Those are like the action points. So those are the places where our eyes are going to be drawn. And I've heard it said that since we, you know, we, um, we with seeing with two eyes, the, this rule of thirds kind of frames things as we're as we're looking. It, it's it's kind of copying our our the binocular vision that we have, where the points of reference, the, the interesting things, are put on. Um, those points where our eyes are naturally drawn. I don't know if that's the best way to say it. I feel like it made sense. Um, so yeah, using the rule of thirds to create pleasing compositions, it gives you uh, a reference for, okay, where do I put this thing in the frame? Kind of putting them on those, on those points can be helpful. In this example here, um, we have our subject on the leftmost vertical third. His eyes are kind of right in that intersection right there. And you can see all this negative space, all this empty space over here is leading in front of him. And that's a really common way to, to frame like an interview subject or in a, like a shot reverse shot where we're cutting back and forth between two people talking. If, we, if we, we're shooting a conversation scene between him and another character, having him on this side, looking in this direction and then cutting over to the other person, we could have them on the other side looking in the opposite direction. So they're almost looking at each other from shot to shot. Um, and that's the rule of thirds. Uh, using various uh, shot types, <clears throat> wide, medium, close. Um, uh, it, I've, I've, I went to a, a class one time where the guy was like, okay, everybody, you know, stick around to the end of the class. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the, the pointer that you need to always, you know, shoot every scene and and you're always going to walk away with enough to cut it together it's always going to be good and his his words of wisdom at the end of the class is, is like a panel which anybody could walk out of if they wanted to but he kind of was good at making people hang on uh was to shoot a wide a medium a close of of every scene and it's it's one of, it's another one of those things where yeah it's kind of obvious that gives you the coverage that you need to edit afterwards um but also if you watch any any like dialogue scene in a film, you're usually gonna have your wide shot, which establishes the scene. You're gonna have medium shots of either both of the characters having a conversation. I'm falling back on this two people talking scene because it's easy to, to visualize. Um, or medium shots of each of those subjects and then close up shots of them speaking and reacting to each other. Um, and if you have those three shots, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll give you enough to cut it together. Um, you know, we're gonna, try to be as efficient as possible and not overshoot um, if we're editing on our phones, but having those different um, angles and compositions will help to create a more dynamic, interesting uh, scene. Something that I, I see sometimes um, when people shoot, it, it can, you know, we can have framed people up really well on a rule of thirds, but you can see in this example here, we've got a little gap above the top of his head to the top of the screen. Um, and that's that's what we call headroom. We want to try to give our subjects headroom. We don't want to give them too much. We wouldn't necessarily want to frame them up with half the frame above his head. But having a little bit of the headroom is gonna it's it's less constricting. If we frame people up too low, where we're kind of trimming off the tops of their heads, it feels confining, um, and and we're not kind of using our space um, as as well as we we should. So. Try to give your subjects a little bit of headroom when you're shooting. And then um, Nina mentioned it earlier, but uh, you know, movement and shots is gonna make is gonna make things interesting as well. And since we're dealing with such a small, lightweight camera that has built-in stabilization, I feel like this that's one of the things that shooting on a mobile device is is really, really good at. You know, we're not dealing with a, a, a big five-pound camera. That's that's going to be all wobbly in our hands. Um, it's a really small device. If you can hold it, you know, steadily, um, it, there's a lot of flexibility in being able to move it around, fit it into narrow spaces. You know, you could do a lot of fun stuff with um, having a tracking shot moving, and you're coming towards an open window, and then you're reaching it through an open window, and there's somebody else outside that you're social distancing with, 
and they they grab the phone from your hand and keep it moving in the same direction and it gives you a uh, you know, really dynamic interesting shot that would be difficult to do with a larger camera and so you can kind of use the 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 format of the device as a benefit here where um you know with audio and, and the quality sometimes there can be drawbacks um there's there's a lot of flexibility in these devices as well anybody have any like questions or comments up to this point this is really weird not being able to sit in the same room with people <laughs> like i was saying earlier this is the first one of these that i've done but i'm I, 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 yeah i do have a question um can on these more sophisticated cell phones can you change depth of field can you blur the background can you do anything to make your shots a little more interesting right um i mean we're dealing with such a small uh sensor in the camera one of the things that that suffers with a smaller sensor size is depth of field um and so with with some phone apps you can go in and custom set your your f-stop and your iso and stuff like that so you could try to force that shallow depth of field um but it's difficult uh when if, especially if we're shooting a, in a lower light environment where we're really trying to um, uh, get it, get quality footage, you know, without that artistic um, imperative. Uh, the a, a lot of newer phones. I've definitely seen this on iPhones, um, and I think it's getting pretty common. Is there's like an artificial depth of field effect that you can put on things, where you can actually it'll uh, you can select your subject and it will like actively blur the background, um, not necessarily like a natural effect of the lens that you're using, but a digital post effect of the Instagram generation, which, you know, they're all tools. And, and if you like the way it looks, it's not, it's not heresy if it's not being done the same way that it's always been done before. Does anybody have experience with those like forced depth of field um, effects on their phones? Because I don't, it's just something that I've seen out there. Um, but yeah, that's um, kind of those, the, the higher end camera, um, being able to use nicer lenses where you can achieve natural uh, shallow depth of field is one of the benefits of those higher end cameras. Um, Another question along those lines with, um, with some cameras and phones, will focus where you touch the screen. And I'm wondering if you can change that focus in the middle of the shot. Mm. You can, I mean, you can adjust, you could, you could select a different part of the screen to force it to adjust to a different uh, uh, place. I know you can, you can hold down on a specific area to, to force it to stay focused on that, on that subject. But um, yeah, by, by selecting a different part of the screen, you could push it. Um, you definitely want to, you know, be tapping on, on your subject to try to force it to, you know, uh, register focus on, on them. Um, in darker environments, it can have a little bit uh, more difficult of a time where you can, it can, you can see it kind of searching for focus sometimes. Um, so I, you would, I think you would want to play around with that um, uh, focus racking effect before you were going to rely on it um just because it sometimes that digital uh focus changing can feel a little sloppy you know where, it, where it's kind of hunting for focus rather than doing like a really sharp change from one to the other but it's a it's a it, it, it could be a really cool effect if it, if it works well on your device jonathan I, I thought i saw that you were unmuting uh no no okay sorry liz did you have anything oh i was just gonna say that um you can on your on an iphone at least i know that you can hold down with your finger and it does a auto focus lock on a point um which is interesting um and i i know that the only sort of i know there's apps you can get to to alter um or to like do the sort of artificial blurring thing but um, yeah, the one on the iPhone I know is the portrait mode, which I think people really like, but I've never seen, I've only seen used for selfies. I, I wonder what it would be like to use in this context. 
And that's and and one of the difficult things that I've run into in trying to plan for this class tonight is just the fact that people are using such a wide variety of different devices, you know, and the capabilities are are, are really different too. Um, and also the the fact that generally with with a camera, when you buy the camera, it can do a certain number of things, and that's what it does, you know. Like more re recently, they've they've had cameras where you can buy you know apps and upgrades and stuff but with with phones there's it's a it's a small computer so there's any number of different uh, applications that you could buy that are going to give it different photography abilities or video abilities or editing abilities um so i was i was consciously trying to avoid things that would incur cost for the user but um there are a lot of a lot of different things out there that you know may may address some of the issues that um, you know, brings up um, or might, you know, make you think of different ways of doing things. Um, and uh, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a really um, interesting uh, field to explore if you have, you know, $7.99 or however much each app costs. Okay, so, so that's my spiel on composition. <clears throat> so as for lighting, um, it's you know generally you know in any kind of video production we're trying to avoid um, backlighting or over backlight backlighting our subject and by that i mean we don't want to um have our subject set up in front of a, a window in the middle of the day where it's dark in the room and it's bright outside because we're either going to have a, a really blown out white blurry background um, that's going to kind of dominate the frame or it, the camera is going to adjust for that bright background and our subject is going to be in darkness um, and with with cell phone cameras they don't they don't respond really well to that and and most cameras don't um, so we want to avoid backlighting um, how do we get around that uh, we can we can move our subject around or we can um, move lighting sources around so you have a, a big window behind the, the desk that you want to shoot at. You could close the shade on the window or you could move the desk um, so that um, that either that light is being blocked or maybe that light goes from being a really um, distracting and shot destroying um, light source in the background. And if you rotate that desk 90 degrees, uh, that light source is now a really nice um, dramatic lighting effect for your subject on the side of their face. Um, moving light light sources around is is key when we're shooting um, with with phones because uh, it, in if we're shooting in our homes um, and we don't have the resources that maybe we would want to have access to um, and we're just using an available light, sometimes it works out really well and sometimes it's just a lot of top-down um, light which can create dark shadows in our subject's eyes. Um, right now, in this room, I have an overhead light over here, but I also have an LED light set up over here. You can see the shadow that it's casting on. If I turn this off, so now this is, this is what we're looking like, which maybe it's okay, but we have a lot of shadow um, co coming straight down. And it, it ends up being kind of flat because there's the same amount of light on me as there is on the background. But you can also can't even really see my eyes very well. The, the eyes kind of just turn into um, blackness. Um, by angling a light or um, adding a light source, we can expose the, our subject to a higher degree than our background, which creates a depth and separates them from the background. This light that's above my head goes from being the only light source to being more of a backlight, um, lighting my back shoulders, um, and it, it creates a, a more pleasing composition. Um, you might not have like an LED light that you can hang up like this, but we can we can kind of get the same effect with a um, like a shop light. If you have like a drop light that's like one of those you know shiny uh, metal cones with a light bulb in it lamp on the other side those are great for being able to just mount it on the on the edge of a door or on a railing or you know anywhere that you might be um, 
and using that to either light your subject or to bounce off a wall or off the ceiling can give you a, a higher degree of lighting, which is going to help your, your footage. Um, flexible, flexible lamps are great. I've got uh, a couple lamps that I've been using for, for meetings since all this stuff has started happening. And just being able to bring a flexible lamp that has like, you know, a bendy arm or something and angle that so it's like above the camera or coming in from the side of the camera is going to help out a lot to make your subject visible, um, but also really in increase the quality of the video footage because oftentimes these cell phones suffer when you're shooting without enough light. Um, that's when you end up with a lot of that digital noise and pixelation. We wanna give the phone enough light to work with um, so that it can, it can give us the best quality footage. Okay, <clears throat> now to audio. Um, the, 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 the fact that we have these you know, small flexible cameras can be beneficial because we can move them around and, and shoot from all, all sorts of different areas and angles. Um, but the audio is, is a big problem because as we move that camera around, we're moving the microphone around too. And anytime that we're recording audio, the, the thing that we, things we want to do, you know, we want to be able to monitor that audio that we're recording, which we're not really able to do when we're moving the phone all around. Um, we want to try to keep the microphone that's recording the audio as close to the subject as possible so that we're kind of capturing them more strongly than the surrounding audio. Um, and that's not possible, you know, if you're setting up your, your phone for your wide shot. Your, your microphone has to be far away too. If you're gonna do a tracking shot, walking behind somebody as they walk down a hallway, um, it could be a really cool shot, but just by the nature of that shot, they're speaking away from the microphone. And so you're gonna, that's really gonna compromise the quality of your audio. So how do we, how do we get around this? Um, unfortunately, it can, it can kind of come down to changing the way you're shooting to, uh, uh, keeping audio in mind um, and changing the way that you're shooting in order to get better sound through the microphone built in in the camera. Um, so um, not necessarily changing the way that you're shooting, but try to get your, your subject to speak loudly and towards the camera. This could be about blocking and it, it might affect the, the, you know, the dramatic effect of how you want to shoot. But having people speak uh, kind of clearly and loudly and trying to have them speak towards the camera is going to be beneficial. It's almost like being a stage actor or something. Um, I was I was shooting a video with my son for one of his class assignments. Um, since we've been, been uh, doing you know all that stuff from home, and he was what was he pretending he was? He was a capybara, which is a, a kind of a a large rodent of unusual size, um, and he he was you know rolling around and crawling around and and he had some lines that he was speaking but i had to keep on reminding him you know even though he's acting out this this scene that he's he's come up with um he can't just deliver those lines in any direction because that's how he feels it should look on the screen he had to be conscious of the fact that if he was speaking down into a pillow rather than turning his head and speaking towards the camera it was going to really negatively affect the audio uh, recording. So we want to try to have our subjects speak loudly and towards the camera. Um, we also want to minimize background noise. And this is, again, something that you want to do anytime that you're recording audio. But, it, but with these you know, small microphones in, in the camera, um, it's going to have even a larger impact if you're shooting in somebody's kitchen and the refrigerator's ice maker is going and you can hear this rattling and this whirring and the, the motor and all, all that noise, it, it can really override the, the audio in the scene. And also if you're gonna be doing the editing afterwards, let's say you're having a conversation scene and I'm falling back on this same hypothetical conversation scene where you have your wide shot and your medium shots and your close-ups. Maybe the, the ice maker's running through your wide shot and then it's not running in one of your medium shots and close-ups, and then it starts running in the next shot over here. Um, once you cut that all together 
and you're cutting the audio back and forth, you could have this noisy wide shot and now we've got quality audio of this person. You cut over here and it's noisy. You cut over here, it's quiet. Um, by unplugging the refrigerator so that that noise isn't happening anymore. I know it's scary to unplug a refrigerator, but it's sometimes what we got to do. Hey, David, um, can I uh, yeah. interject a tip? Um, you can uh, put your car keys in the refrigerator. Absolutely, yeah. I've, I've definitely, I've done that and it, it works. Um, if you, you know, you, you don't want to forget. You don't want to forget that you unplugged somebody's refrigerator. <laughs> that's, that's, that would be terrible. Um, but yeah, uh, just being conscious of what noises there are around you and trying to minimize those as much as possible. And it might, it, it might just be, oh, it's, you know, it, there's a noise coming in from outside. I just have to close the window. Or it might be, I'm going to ask my neighbor not to mow their lawn for half an hour so I can finish shooting this thing. But just having the presence of mind to um, to to see that as an issue and and deal with it before it's too late is um, a really helpful way to improve your audio quality. Um, keeping the mic closer to your subject will improve the quality of the audio recording. And and we could you know we could think of that as keeping the camera closer to the subject because the mic is built into the camera. But we may also um, choose to use another device to record sound. Um, so if, let's say, we're shooting our dialogue scene, maybe we've got our two actors and they both have phones, maybe they could both turn their phone on and uh, start recording using the memo app on their phone. And they could put those phones in their front pockets in their shirts or you know, tape them on the inside of their shirt or even just put them on the table in front of them. Um, recording that sound and then syncing it with the video that you shoot. Um, is it, Since that microphone is closer to your subjects and placed in a, in, in a, in a, a location where they're speaking towards it, it's gonna, it's gonna have higher quality sound than the, the camera that you're shooting with. Um, and that's really helpful. Yeah. A question. Can you really guarantee sync? Um, it's, I, I think that it could be an issue with, um, with phones. If you're, I, I think that what could, what could the issue be? The issue, if, if there's like a variable frame rate or a variable, um, bit rate, I've seen issues definitely with, like streamed video versus recorded audio where you know there's a lot of drift if if you're recording and the devices are recording at different frequencies like say one one thing's re recording at 44.1k and the other's recording at 48k they could drift over time um one way to to um minimize that issue if it is one is to kind of keep your takes short um because sync is going to uh, sync issues are going to get worse and worse over time, usually. Um, and so, if you're if you're keeping your shots to a minute or less, um, which if you think about it, that's actually a pretty long take. If somebody's like delivering a minute of dialogue, that's impressive. Um, then, even if there is a sync issue, it probably won't be noticeable over that short period of time. Yeah, I, when I've seen sync issues, it gets really dramatic when you're shooting for you know, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour, over that period of time, you may get a drift of like a few seconds. Um, but with shorter clips, it, it's, it can, it's less of an issue. But that's it, it's something to, to worry about for sure. Um, sync has, has definitely eaten a few hours of my life. Good point. Um, People might want to consider also using a just clapping their hands or using some kind of informal clapstick right yeah yeah absolutely um having having that for reference for syncing um i like with with some of these apps that i've been looking at i don't know if they have any automatic syncing features they probably don't that's kind of a high-end uh, feature to have with usually we're using adobe premiere um at northampton open media and those you know, higher end um, editing softwares have uh, a way to automatically synchronize different clips based on the audio waveforms. Um, but yeah, by clapping, you can then go and uh, look at your separate clips and you'll see that spike of the clap. 
and then you can just line that spike up so they're all like all those um tracks start on the same frame so that it, it at least is starting off in the right spot um and then usually what you would do if you're using an external audio source you would then probably mute or delete the audio from your camera um, because the the lower quality of that audio is, is just going to compromise the mix <clears throat> um, some other some other options um, I know Nina you were uh, asking earlier about um, audio there are definitely microphones that you can buy that attach to um, mobile phones or mobile devices. Um, go back to my trusty B and H. And share that screen. So there are lavalier microphones that you can uh, attach directly to your phone. Um, and so this could work with the the phone that you're using as your camera or probably more likely you would connect this to a secondary device that would um, just be capturing audio um, so something like that you could clip onto somebody's shirt or tape out under somebody's shirt and that's really going to help to get that mic as close as possible to the audio source um, there are directional microphones you can see this one actually has a um, iPhone uh, lightning plug or whatever they call it um, uh, right on the bottom of it and so by plugging that directly into your phone you're going to have uh, what's called a directional microphone mounted on the on the phone rather than probably what's it's probably a cardioid or an omni that's built in there with a directional microphone it's going to help to eliminate sounds coming from the sides or from behind the microphone so it's going to it's not like gonna reach out and make somebody sound closer than they actually are, but it will help to minimize those extraneous noises and the echo of people's voices, you know, kind of that roomy sound that you get sometimes is from their voices um, kind of coming back um, off the walls. Um, and so something like that could be helpful. Um, I don't have experience with these, so I wouldn't, you know, this isn't necessarily an endorsement of these devices, but there are options out there. Um, for improving the audio recording capabilities of mobile devices. Okay. Everybody doing good? It's almost seven. I've got a little bit more to go here. Um, okay. Editing. So if if we're if we're really uh doing all this in the phone there are options for editing your project um in the phone as well uh with apple devices uh iMovie is available for download for free you with us nina yeah i'm just i just came in and i'm changing devices oh okay i'm gonna mute myself That's, sorry okay. No, no, no worries. I just wanted to make sure that you weren't uh, uh, having a uh, problem. Uh, okay, so editing. So with 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 iPhones and uh, uh, iPads, you can edit with iMovie. Uh, iMovie's been around forever. Uh, there's nothing wrong with iMovie. It's probably better than a lot of these other examples I'm going to talk about. Uh, but I haven't used iMovie since uh, 2003. So I don't have a lot of uh, iMovie experience to impart on you um this this is a link uh to a youtube video that i'm not going to play because there's a million youtube videos on how to use imovie but i'd be happy to share that one with people it seemed like a helpful one but there are a lot of resources out there to help people get up to speed with imovie um and that's you know a, a really good option it has uh you know you can you can cut you can add music you can um, edit audio you can uh add titles you can export, send to YouTube and other, you know, uploading options. So that's that's a really good option. Um, Android phones um, don't have a, a really good native uh, editing system like like Apple devices do. 
um, so in the photos app, you can do some light editing, but it's, it's not, it's not great. Um, I, I played around with it a little bit and didn't really love what I saw. Some of the other apps um, that you can try, uh, there's, I don't know if anybody has a better way to pronounce this. I'm going to say Kenny Master because it's kind of like Cine, like, you know, like cinema or, um, but Kenny or Kind Master. Uh, it's a free um, editing software. And Let's see. I'm going to share it from my phone. I'm not sure how well this is going to work. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen on my phone. And so this is uh, Kenny Master or Senny Master or Kind Master. I'm not sure. Um, and it's it seems to pretty uh, be a pretty decent um, editing application, and you can use it for free. Um, so. Here's a, a project that I was editing earlier where we have um, on the right hand, upper right hand corner, we have options for bringing in multiple sources. So I could go in, I could bring in some media. Um, let's see what's good. Um, we can we can add those things to our sequence, and then we can we can adjust the length of clips in our sequence by tapping on them and dragging kind of that yellow handlebar on the side, uh, one way or the other. And then we can we can uh, play and preview. By tapping the play button, Cable accent channel. Um, and we can export, uh, which is you know it, it kind of does all the all the basic things that we need to do in editing. And so this is uh, an application that I've used a little bit, not a ton, but it's free and it's available, I believe, for both uh, iPhone and Android devices. Um, downside of it, it when you're using the free version. It is going to export with that uh, watermark in the upright, uh, upper right hand corner, uh, the made with uh, Kenny Master. Um, and, you know, that's not great. There's a paid version, which is, it doesn't include that uh, watermark. <clears throat> Another option that we have is. Uh, this app that's called Power, what's it called? Power Director. Um, and we can do a lot of the same stuff. Uh, so I could do it, make a new project. We can do 16 by nine, which is, you know, like a panorama, like a widescreen, nine by 16, which is vertical, or one by one, which is square, kind of like an Instagram aspect ratio. We can go in here and from the phone, I can select different clips um, and add them by hitting the plus symbol in the middle of the clip. And then I can play. Again, I can use like the little uh, handlebars on the sides of the clips. To adjust the lengths of them, it's kind of clunky. Um, there we go. 
but we can do some, you know, we can do some basic editing right in the phone, which is going to make it quick and easy to, to get to it. Uh, there's no uh, transferring the footage. There's no um, having to use a separate application and a separate device. Um, and so that's kind of a cool thing. And then I will. Stop sharing. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Hi, Erica. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, did you just join? Is that right? I did. I, okay, cool. Sorry, we started at six. Um, I know it's okay. I just I I missed it. I just thought I would uh, listen to the end. Cool. Uh, um, All right. Is it is it being um, uploaded anywhere or? It's actually it's streaming on uh, on on our channel right now on channel twelve, and we're also recording it. It'll be on YouTube, and uh, you can yeah you can access it that way on our oh, YouTube cool. channel. Oh cool! I'll I'll check that out. Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, uh, please please let me know. Um, if any if anything specifically that you were interested in, we could. Maybe All right. Um, one other option that I wanted to to touch on is. Uh, DaVinci Resolve, which is a free editing software that you can get for both PCs and Macs. So this isn't a software that would run on your phone, but it's a fully featured um, editing software that you could shoot on your phone or, or whatever device you may be using, transfer it to your computer, and then edit with, with this software. Um, and it's a really um, well-made, uh, software it's made by a company called black magic design um, they have cameras that they make and they they, they put out the software to um, package with their cameras um, but you can download it it's totally free um, it's called davinci resolve and basically your, your workflow runs from across the bottom of the screen here where we have media where we can um, bring in media into our project. Uh, we can go to cut where, where we would review our footage and we could trim clips down right there in, in, in that section. Then we have our edit section where we can bring, bring those clips into a sequence, just like in, in any other editing software um, that you might be comfortable using. Um, It has options for um, doing color correction, which is um, really one of the strongest uh, parts of this software. It has really fully featured color correction uh, tools, um, and you can even do some kind of like post effects and uh, audio uh, editing as well. And then, you know, just like with any other software, you can export. Um, it doesn't uh, put a watermark. There's no limitations on the features of the software. It's a totally free. Um, editing software. And if you're if you're interested in, you know, using the device that you have at home to shoot, but you you also want to have a little bit more control in the editing process, um, I think a, editing on a, a a laptop or a desktop computer is always going to give you a a more you know finely honed control over the process. Um, I me, mean, I've got big you know, clumsy fingers. And when I try to um, work with a with with an with an application like an ed editing application on a, on a small device, just interacting with the features um, can be a limiting factor in, in getting what I'm looking to, to do. So. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a, that's an option. And there are other editing softwares out there as well that um, you can you can some you can get get for free, some with a subscription or a purchase price that, that can be good for that. Huh. All right, everybody still awake? Uh, I'm sorry, that's a kind of a oh, dumb thing to say. <laughs> um, I'm not pointing fingers. I just it's just weird uh, <laughs> trying to do this online. Uh, new experience. Yeah. Um, and so, and and then I mean something that we didn't really touch on that much, but um, the production process is the same. You know, you still want to you still want to do pre-production where you're 
if, if you're working from a script, you want to write that script and you want to come up with your shot list of, of the shots that you need and, and you want to um, make sure that the people that you're going to have in your film are comfortable being in your film and, and communicate thoroughly what your expectations are. Uh, you want to have, have a plan going in and, um, and that's going to make all these things easier where the phone is really just a tool. Um, it's that pre-production and production and post-production where you're, you know, if you have um, visually and, and, you know, thematically, if you have a vision in your mind, um, that, should, that should really be the driving force. And there's, you know, a million different cameras out there that you could use to achieve that. So you just wanna try to, try to treat the phone as a tool, as a, a filmmaking device and, um, and try to give as much, um, you know, care to uh, composing that as possible. And that's kind of my, my, my big wrap up. But uh, does anybody have any other questions or any contributions that they'd like to share or um, in good recipes? What, like what, what kind of bread is everybody baking? I'm assuming you're not serious. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, uh, this, is, this is kind of me reaching the end of this class, but um, you know, it, does anybody have any, um, if, if anybody has any other thing they'd like to bring up or, um, or anything like that, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, There's a question in the chat. Oh. Is iMovie similar to the other editing tools? Um, yeah, it, it, iMovie's uh, yeah. similar. Um, some would say that Final Cut Pro transitioned to being a little more like iMovie when when uh, uh, Final Cut X uh, came out. Um, some of the things that that I didn't like about iMovie um, when you when you bring footage into iMovie, it does a lot of transcoding, which um, can be processor heavy, and it ends up um, producing a lot more, like a, a lot of files that can, that can bog down a computer sometimes. Um, but it's, it's, a uh, it's very similar in the layout, you know, you're, you're working with a, a, a process where you're importing footage into the program, you're selecting which clips you want to use, you're laying those out in a sequence where you can adjust the length of those clips and, you know, make other effect uh, controls as far as color and, audio, uh, you can add transitions, you can add titles, um, and you, you can export a video at the end. Um, so um, yeah, uh, iMovie is, is uh, fully functional as far as I'm concerned. I think from, from my experience, if you really want to do anything with any polish at all, you're going to need something to step up from iMovie. You can, I mean, I use Adobe. Mm -hmm. I use the Creative Suite and it, yeah, you know, it just gives you so much more flexibility. It's true. I agree. I, I just I would never um, if somebody has a workflow that they're comfortable with that gives them what they're something they're happy with. I wouldn't ever want to begrudge them that um, I do agree that the higher end editing softwares give you a lot more control and a lot more um, flexibility. Um, sometimes uh, you may start using iMovie and when you start like bumping into the boundaries of it that's when you know it's time to like journey out and and try to find something that's maybe a little more capable um but a, a lot of people have started out with iMovie and it, it gives you an introduction to it and and i think with editing um you know there's the artistic element of it um but then the you know as far as the software is concerned once you get the comfortable with the layout of of an editing software it gives you a really good starting point for any other editing software you, where you can kind of you can recognize what does what and and you can you can tinker with it until you can you can make it work for you um so yeah if you're using iMovie and you're finding that it's not meeting all your needs and it's not um giving you what you're looking for um premiere pro or you know uh, creative cloud um, uh, premiere pro is what we use at northampton open media and we've been using that for years and uh, really, um, really like it. Uh, the uh, Final Cut X is, you know, I, I kind of badmouthed it a little bit, but 
people really like Final Cut X. Um, if you're really interested in getting into the industry, um, um, what's it called? You know, Avid. The big one, Avid is the, the big one, which is used in a lot of post houses for, for um, broadcast and, and Hollywood productions. Although, you know, you'll you see uh, Adobe bragging about it every time a movie's edited in Premiere. Um, and DaVinci Resolve really is, a, it's, it's a decent editing software. Um, and if, if price is the, the, the barrier, then that's a, a good one to play around with um, because it has a, a lot of really, really good features. I, I know people will um, sometimes edit in Premiere and they'll actually send their footage out to uh, DaVinci Resolve to do their color correcting because they, the tools are better than they are in uh, Premiere and then mm. um, export from there. As far as lighting, the 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 light that I'm using here today is um, it's a, like a, a one foot square LED panel that you can you can get those for a hundred bucks, uh, not too much money, um, and they can run on battery power. You can plug them into the wall. So if you are looking to up your game at home, um, it's it's kind of one of the the, the things you can do to uh, make your your productions a little bit more sparkly. Um, and and but other than you know those things like stabilization and better lighting and better microphones you know composition and story are really the the, the, the pillars of any good production so you want to focus on your visual style and also your storytelling um and yeah focus on that that camera being a tool Thank you.